Today I'll be chatting with Erin, also known as Food Science Babe, about the Dirty Dozen and why you don't need to fear conventional fruits and veggies. We discuss which pesticides are used in both conventional and organic farming, how they are tested and regulated, and how much is actually in your food. Erin debunks the Dirty Dozen's unscientific methods and exposes the pro-organic, fear-driven agendas behind this list. I hope you'll come away feeling empowered to make food choices rooted in science, not fear. Food Science Babe has worked in the food industry for over 10 years in both the conventional and organic sectors as a food scientist and engineer. She has a bachelor's in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota. Let's dig in. Welcome to Get Real Health. I'm your host, Dr. Chana Davis. This show cuts through the noise to give you science-based insights from real experts so that you can make smart, healthy choices. Welcome to the show, Erin. Thank you so much for taking time to come on again. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I'm really looking forward to today's topic, the dirty dozen and other um, aspects of pesticide safety on our food, because I know this is an area that's really um, rife with fear, and that's something that you're passionate about, something that I'm passionate about, um, and I think we can do a lot of uh, myth busting today. Yeah, definitely. So to get us started, I think it's really important to just get the terminology straight. So would you mind giving a really brief overview of what's a pesticide and then what's the, the herbicide term? You People also hear a lot. So those two terms and without even getting into the organic part first and, and just a general concept of how those work. Yeah, so um, pesticide is really an umbrella term. So it includes um, everything from herbicides, which are used to kill weeds, um, uh, insecticides, which are used to kill bugs, um, fungicides used to kill fungus. Uh, I'm trying to think. There's a bunch of different types mm -hmm. of essentially anything that you could, would consider a pest in farming. So like I said, mm -hmm. weeds, insects, fungus, mold, um, all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's an umbrella term. So whenever, um, you know, somebody says something is a pesticide, it could, it could also be a herbicide or an insecticide. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just really, it includes anything essentially that is approved um, for use, you know, in farming that would be used to kill any type of pest really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so that's good starting point now down to layer on top of that organic and conventional. I think actually a lot of people are just just to pause and say organic pesticides exist, right? <laughs> organic yeah. doesn't mean no pesticides. So what's the difference between a traditional pest or non organic pesticide and a organic pesticide? Yeah, so organic essentially um, restricts the the, the specific pesticides that can be used in organic farming. So obviously conventional, you know, has a list of pesticides that are approved for use in conventional farming. And um, so organic would basically be a subset of those. Um, most of them are considered to be uh, natural. So that's one of the, there are a few synthetic pesticides that are approved for organic use as well, but um, it's essentially just a subset of pesticides used in conventional farming and most of them are considered to be natural. Mm -hmm. I think the term synthetic is worth noting. I mean, that's, it seems to me, I mean, is it really just the difference of how they are made? Like one is extracted from nature and the other is made in a lab? And that's what you mean by synthetic? Um, kind of. I mean, you know, obviously, even if something is considered to be natural, um, you know, it could still be extracted, concentrated, essentially made in a lab. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that it's like, you're necessarily just taking something exactly like it is from nature, you know, obviously like uh, refining is involved with the naturally derived ones. So it's basically just, um, you know, derived from nature versus, you know, derived synthetically in a lab. Um, but yeah, in terms of safety and toxicity, uh, they're going to have overlapping toxicities, whether it is from a natural source, source or from a synthetic source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe it's worth just taking a quick step back to, to just note that the organic label encompasses multiple requirements, right? So pesticides, which types yep. of pesticides you could use is one aspect. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? 
Yeah. So like I said, just the subset of natural pesticides is one of the requirements. And you can actually go on uh, the FDA website into the, the Code of Fed Federal Regulations and see, at least for the U.S., what what there's a whole list of, uh, I think, if you just would Google like National Organic Program Pesticides, um, you can see the whole list of pesticides approved for use. Um, and so it would, it, they're, they're mostly going to be naturally occurring ones. There are some synthetic ones as well. Um, so that, so yes, that is just one of the regulations under the National Organic Program. You know, there are other things, you know, as far as not allowing for GMOs and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, now maybe the next step, I think, uh, in this uh, discussion to set the stage for, I do want to get to the dirty dozen eventually, but I want to just make sure we have all the groundwork in place, is how yep. do we, um, you said that, that organic or natural pesticides and, you know, and non-organic or just, you know, de novo made in a lab pesticides have overlapping toxicity profiles. So what does a toxicity profile look yep. like? How do you put a number on that and how do you determine it? Yeah. So basically, um, I've shared a few times just different charts kind of comparing some uh, common pesticides that are used in organic farming and conventional farming. And so obviously you have toxicity to humans and there's occupational exposure as well as exposure to consumers. So that's one thing that sort of gets confused a lot too, is like, obviously, um, you know, toxicity when you're using it as a pesticide applicator, um, mm -hmm. you're going to be more concerned about the high levels of it, you know, even potentially acute toxicity if you were to get it on your skin or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, versus when you're talking about consumers um, potentially consuming trace levels on uh, produce, you know, you're more concerned about the chronic toxicity. So like mm -hmm. the toxicity over time of ingesting a little bit over time. And so, you know, whether it is naturally derived or synthetic, we need to know what those tough, you know, what those safety levels are. And so it doesn't matter if it's naturally derived or synthetic. Um, there are some naturally derived pesticides that, that can be toxic at a lower dose. Um, so, not only is it important to know the toxicity for humans, but also um, toxicity to the environment as well. And, you know, how persistent it is in the environment. Does it, does, you know, what's the half-life? Does it break down readily in the environment? Does it, does it persist in the environment for a long time? So um, a lot of times, a lot of these natural ones um, tend to persist in the environment longer than some of the synthetic ones that more easily break down too. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it depends on what you're talking about, but, yeah. but I would say it's important to, to understand the toxic toxicity, not only to humans, but to the environment as well. Yeah. And like so, I said, they're going to be overlapping. Yeah. So just to, to kind of, I like my kind of two by twos or my like matrices, I guess. So under one dimension, when you try to put a number on toxicity on one dimension is what's the root of exposure. So you normally have a number yeah. for um, oral exposure consuming it and you have an, yep. an another number for skin exposure or just which would be in like an operator and then the second right. dimension to that is there's two types of toxicity you want to get a number for you want to get a number for acute toxicity if i take it now yep. is there going to be a near-term consequence like if i chug a bottle of um, my kid chugs a bottle of cold medicine or something and that's like yep. you're looking at it for an acute near-term event and then there's a different number for chronic toxicity so those are, right. I and mean, that's my understanding of, of some of the numbers yep. that you that you try to derive when you are um, analyzing a pesticide. And as you yep. say, so there's the that's the human considerations. Then there's also environmental considerations. So all of those things are measured. Um, yeah. And I think we talked about this on our last podcast. When you're trying to put a number on toxicity to humans, um, whether it's acute, whether it's chronic, whether it's from oral or whether from skin exposure, you get that number from a combination of sources from animal experiments, from sometimes yeah. human epidemiological studies, um, yeah. and from cell line experiments, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, um, I guess just like a quick, yeah, like you said, you know, mostly they're coming from animal experiments. And so what they end up trying to 
find is what is called the NOAEL, which is the No Observable Adverse Effects Level. Um, so that's essentially the dose uh, that would, that over that dose, it might have some adverse effects. Under that dose, it likely wouldn't have adverse effects. Mm -hmm. um, and so they take that level to determine the ADI or the RFD, depending on um, where it's coming from. But the ADI would be the um, acceptable daily intake or RFD, which is called the reference dose. Essentially, mm -hmm. how much could you consume every single day and still not have any negative effects from it? And so mm -hmm. that level is set hundreds to thousands of times below that NOAEL level. So mm -hmm. there's a bunch of safety factors that are being built into these numbers um, to ensure that even if we are getting a little bit on multiple foods throughout the day, it's not even gonna come close to that NOAEL level. And um, so even then beyond that, once they test for these pesticides, they are typically being detected at levels, um, once again, hundreds to thousands of times below those reference doses. So, mm -hmm. um, so that would just be an example of chronic toxicity. Like they're making sure that because I get that question a lot, like, okay, well, what if we're eating a bunch of different foods with with these pesticides on them? You know, yeah. could it be approaching a harmful amount throughout the day? Mm -hmm. And, you know, essentially, no, they're they're creating, you know, they're building in a bunch of safety factors to ensure mm -hmm. that that won't happen. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, so with that sort of framework for toxicity, um, you know, what would a what would a sort of scientifically valid analysis, so say you had, you know, 10 fruits and vegetables, you wanted to see which one has the biggest pesticide burden, what would be the reasonable way to look at that? Yeah, so what you would, obviously you would want to um, test them to see what chemicals are present. And so the first thing would be what chemicals are present and what dose is present. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously each different chemical is going to have a different uh, toxic dose. And so essentially you would compare the concentration on the food to, well, well you would compare it to the tolerance level really, which is what the USDA sets um, based on all those uh, safety factors that I, that I said were built in. They, they essentially set a tolerance level. Um, whereas, you know, it will be safe if the concentration on specific foods is below this tolerance level. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so essentially you just need to know what, what the chemical is, what the concentration is versus the acceptable um, tolerance level or, you know, toxic dose. Mm -hmm. It's the amount that you have relative yeah. to how much is considered safe. Exactly. Matters, not yeah. the actual yeah. number. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And even if there are multiple different, um, you know, chemicals detected on a specific um, fruit or vegetable, you know, again, it's not the fact that this one has 10 different chemicals and this one has five. So five is better. You have yeah. to take the dose into account as well. So, yeah. 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 So um, who, so who is that assessment being done and who does it and what do they find? Yeah, so the USDA um, every year takes a large sample of produce and they test it for, you can actually go on the USDA PDP website and, and look up literally like every single fruit or vegetable, um, every single chemical that's detected and it'll show you the amount that is detected. Um, and so basically, yeah, the USDA, uh, they test it every year as a part of their uh, pesticide data program. And they find year after year that 99 plus percent of what they test is um, the, the pesticides that they detect are well below the tolerance levels that have been set based on, like I said, all of those safety factors. So mm -hmm. really the USDA PDP data, um, while it is sometimes used to scare consumers that there are pesticides on foods, it's really showing us that our food supply is very safe from a pesticide residue perspective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's consistently showing us this year after year. Mm -hmm. Well, I was doing um, some, a little bit of digging around before our chat today, and I actually found a paper from, it's like, it's 10, it's 10 year old data, but it gives you a, like a sense of how low are we talking about? I guess it's just a nice summary. So this paper from, in the journal toxicology from 2011 used the same data like the you said pdp but it's um, pesticide data program yeah. um so yeah. they used the publicly available data 
and they analyzed to see how does the actual dose in the, it was actually, they chose the dirty dozen vegetables, like fruits and veggies, I believe. How okay. does the actual yeah. dose compare to what we know to be safe, you know, for the long-term consumption? And they said only one out of 120 exceeded 1%. So um, mm -hmm. 119 out of 120 were less than 1%. And then they said, uh, let's see, three quarters of them were less than one and a less than a thousandth of what's considered safe. Um, and 40% of them were less than 10 thousandth of what was considered safe. Um, yep. Yeah, so, I think that's consistent so, even currently is that typically 40%, uh, like up to 40%, um, they can't even detect any pesticide residues at all. So, yep. Mm -hmm. Now, however, this analysis, um, do they test every pesticide and how do, do they test organic and conventional or is there any bias in which ones they choose to test? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say there's bias. However, um, a lot of the naturally derived pesticides, just because the fact that they're natural, um, they, a lot of them really haven't been as, uh, rigorously tested as some of these synthetic ones because you know when you come up with a new synthetic pesticide it's going to have to go through a bunch of testing before it can be approved and so some of these uh natural ones that have essentially gotten i guess you could say grandfathered in um because they've been used for so long they a lot of them really haven't gone through the rigorous testing that some of the synthetic ones have been. Mm -hmm. And also um, the USDA PDP doesn't actually test for most of the pesticides used in organic farming, ironically. Um, I think I think there's, there's like one of them that they test for, but they don't have, um, they don't have ways to test for a lot of these uh, natural pesticides. So we aren't, really getting a true read on organic. You know, I'm not saying that would be a reason to be concerned about it at all, but, um, you know, they are testing for most of the synthetic pesticides, but there are, you know, there are some of the natural ones being used in organic that they, um, they don't have the methodology to, uh, hmm. methodology to test for. So they literally don't um, that is one assay? thing too. Right. Yep. Whoa. Yeah. Yep. And uh, that's one thing that uh, we had talked about before we started filming, but Stephen Savage, he has, he has a few articles um, that kind of, he, he kind of uh, writes about that at the end too, after he analyzes the data. But that is one thing we, we really don't have a true read on organic uh, produce just because they don't have the ability to test for all of the pesticides hmm. used in organic farming. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So now, so now that we, let's compare um, how the Dirty Dozen is constructed to what makes sense scientifically. So can, can you explain how the Dirty Dozen comes up yeah, with their so ranking? Yep. So basically what the EWG does, um, and that's the environmental working group, but they, so they, every spring they come out with their Dirty Dozen list and um, basically, so they're not taking any new data. They're taking this USDA PDP data and they are, they are essentially just counting the number of pesticides detected on each thing. So I'll just make up an example, and this isn't correct, but, um, you know, strawberries are typically uh, in the number one spot, you know, every year on their list. And so let's just say they're detecting six different pesticides on strawberries. And then you have something like blueberries, and let's say they detect four different, different pesticides on blueberries. You know, blueberries would be would be lower on the list than strawberries just purely based on the fact that there are less uh, pesticides they're detecting on there but they aren't taking the dose into account whatsoever so it's really not an evidence-based list because not only are they not taking the dose into account but they're also not comparing it to those tolerance levels and so mm -hmm. you know the fact that they are detecting these pesticide residues at super, super low amounts, you know, so low that, it, that a, a human would have to eat hundreds of servings of any of them to get even close to a potentially harmful level. Um, you know, so they're not taking any, any of that into account. They're hundreds, literally so just, just, to, saying, just to interject hundreds of servings daily, right? Daily. Yeah. Literally every day. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, they're not taking into account the dose or comparing it to those tolerance levels. And so, 
you know, it's really, it's really creating a lot of unnecessary fear. Um, and it's taking this data that's showing us how safe our food supply is and, you know, unnecessarily um, scaring consumers. And another huge thing as well is that they are only making the list based on conventional produce. And so they're taking the data from conventional strawberries, conventional oh. blueberries. Con yeah. So they're not even, they never even mention the fact that organic uses pesticides. So they're also perpetuating that misinformation that organic doesn't use pesticides because they're literally only making this list based off of conventional produce. They're not mentioning at all the fact that organic uses pesticides too or the fact that most of the pesticides used in organic farming aren't even being tested for. And so, you know, it's it's incredibly biased and just really scaring consumers unnecessarily. So does the US PDP program um, test organic produce as well or does it only test conventional? Yes, so they test organic. However, they are testing it for mostly pesticides used in conventional farming. Which are, and they're not and allowed so, to use, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. And so like, that's another thing too, that people will take that data and say, organic has less pesticides. And it's like, well, yes, they have less pesticides used in conventional farming because they literally can't use those pesticides <laughs> and they're not testing for the organic pesticides. Yeah. So yes, but, but even so the, the EWG doesn't even, doesn't even mention that organic has pesticide residues that organic uses pesticides. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's so biased. They're only talking about conventional. And like I said, they're not taking dose or the fact that it's thousands of times below the tolerance level is being detected. So it's, right, it's right. so biased. Right. Wow. Yeah. I, I hadn't yeah. really thought about the fact <laughs> that they're testing. Um, they're only testing for pesticides that are basically forbidden for use in organic. Exactly. Farming. Yeah. And um, you'll see, you'll see like studies like that all the time too. Like I've posted a lot on my page, different studies where they, um, they test the urine of people on, you know, eating a week of a conventional diet and then they'll test for a specific pesticide mm -hmm. only used in conventional farming. And then they'll say, well, you're consuming less pesticides when you eat organic. Cause then they'll go on an organic diet for a week and they'll test that same pesticide. And it's right. like, well, obviously they can't use that pesticide yeah. in organic farming. So yeah. it's the same thing that's happening with this dirty dozen list as well. So all it's really showing is that organic farmers are following the rules and not using non-organic pesticides. It doesn't really tell well, you much about. You could even dispute that because there are some synthetic pesticides that are being detected on organic produce. And I find that to be the more, I guess, uh, I'm not, I don't want to say it's not, it's still not concerning. They're very, very low levels, but I guess if you're going to like make anything shocking about the results, <laughs> you know, that could be one thing that would be like, oh my gosh, they're finding synthetic pesticides on organic yeah. produce. But well, I actually again, read, not something people... yeah, sorry. I, I read, um, because there was this, all this hoopla when an impossible burger had like, I don't know, one drop of glyphosate. I don't remember what it was just like, yeah. so there was this big effort to like get people worried about impossible burgers because they had, you know, some amount of glyphosate. And then um, yeah. I learned in the process of trying to put that number in context that organic farming is actually allowed to have um, conventional pesticides, but it has to be under like 1% or something. There's some threshold where it's okay as yep. long as it doesn't exceed a certain percent. And so the amount yep. in the Impossible Burger was actually in line with organic produce, would, would have been permitted to have an organic label. The levels yeah. were that low. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because that is one thing that... Um, that I mentioned earlier. So, so in those articles that Stephen Savage writes, he, he also analyzes, um, that exact, uh, number. And so mm -hmm. I, I want to say it's like 40%. No, I think it's like 56% of the conventional produce would be, would be considered acceptable under the, those organic standards of, right. I think it's below 5% of yeah, synthetic that pesticides familiar. are I allowed. Think you're right. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so it's, maybe I'm even thinking, maybe it's even more, I don't, I'd have to look, but it's a large percentage percentage of conventional produce that yeah. would, would be acceptable essentially under that rule. And yeah. so it's just interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in fact, like if we talked about this paper earlier from 2011, it would have, it suggests that the vast, vast, vast majority of it, I mean, if only one out of 120 exceeded 1%, 
then yeah it should be the vast most, majority yeah right? most of them would be considered okay under organic the organic you know pesticide regulations of of you know the percentage of synthetic pesticides allowed mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so to wrap up i just wanted to bring this back to consumers who are feeling probably even maybe even more confused i hope maybe less confused <laughs> but what does this mean for produce shopping and what are you, what are you really what is the organic label offering um uh, from a pesticide perspective and then maybe just sort of close with uh acknowledgement of this being not just about pesticides right and and that the label there is a, yeah the label so i would say i would say definitely like don't pay attention to the dirty dozen um another thing that i just want to mention as well because i know i always get people asking like why would the ewg do that like what's their mm -hmm. point well they, they yes. are funded they are funded by the organic industry. You can go on their website and see their funding page. Um, yeah. A bunch of different organic companies fund them. So essentially what they're doing is they're trying to scare consumers specifically over conventional produce so that they will buy organic produce. And so mm -hmm. that's essentially the goal with the Dirty Dozen. And yeah. um, I also wanna mention too that there there is, and I've shared it probably 10 different times on my page, but there is a peer reviewed study also showing that um, basically telling consumers that there is an unsafe amount of pesticide residue on foods, um, which isn't true, that essentially really, it, it, it impacts specifically low income shoppers mm -hmm. and they end up buying less produce overall because, yeah. you know, obviously if you think about it and you're at the store and you can't necessarily afford organic and you're hearing all this stuff about conventional being, yeah toxic and poisonous and um you know so you're just not gonna buy any produce at all if if your store doesn't carry organic or if you can't mm -hmm. afford it or maybe you decide to buy organic and so you only buy a few different things when you could buy a lot more if you were mm -hmm. to buy conventional and so i think the biggest thing is just you know eat your fruits and vegetables and don't don't worry about organic don't worry about conventional you know like if if you're at the store and the you know, the conventional strawberries look better to you than the organic, you know, don't, that was one thing. I mean, I honestly used to be a consumer that believed in the dirty dozen. And mm -hmm. I specifically, I always knew that strawberries were at the top of the list. And I would always make sure that I would buy organic strawberries because I thought, I thought I was poisoning myself if I was eating the conventional ones. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you uh, like organic and you want to pay more for it, go ahead. It's safe. You know, like all of it is safe. So I don't want to, I guess the biggest takeaway is like, don't be discouraged from buying fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if you, if, if all you can afford is conventional, or if, you know, you understand that organic isn't worth the extra money by all means buy conventional yeah. and really just don't listen to these lists. Um, like I said, the USDA data is showing us year after year, how incredibly safe our produce is. And, um, to take that data and manipulate it and scare consumers is just really, it's really not helpful for anybody. Uh, yeah, personally, I just tend to choose the produce that looks the most delicious. So if I've got, like BC has amazing strawberries and amazing produce. So if I have like a local BC strawberry, I don't care if it's organic or not. And if, I, if there's an imported organic strawberry from somewhere else, I'm choosing the BC local, like, Right. Fresh from the farm down there every day, and I'm fortunate to be able to to, to do that. Um, that's mm -hmm. that's for me. It's choosing what's most delicious, and that I can that I can afford. Yeah. Yep. And the more the better. <laughs> for yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, just to, to wrap up, then, uh, are there any additional resources you want to share, and um, and also just let people know where they can find more from you? Yeah. So, um, I try to organize like my, my Instagram page is the easiest thing for me to organize, but I have a bunch of highlights on my Instagram. So I have a highlight on organic. I have a highlight on the dirty dozen. So every, like literally everything, every resource I mentioned here is going to be linked in one of my highlights on my page. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you want to check that out and then, yeah, you can food science, babe on Instagram, food science, babe on Facebook. Um, I have Twitter and then also, uh, I have a Patreon too, if you want to contribute to, to that as well. And then I do some live Q and A's, um, if you're a member of that too. So. Thank you. I think, um, just to, to remind some that came up earlier, the PDP program for the, the U S I don't actually know the name of the Canadian one. I assume that Canada does something similar in other countries. They also do. I know they do. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what it's called, but I, I, I'm pretty sure they do the same. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, uh, and then there was one that you've shared on your page before called uh, safefruitsandveggies.com. Is that right? Yeah, that's the one where you can go and there's a little like calculator there's there so you can you can find out how many servings of each of the things that are on the dirty dozen each year that you would have to eat in one day to reach a potentially harmful level. And like I said, they're going to be hundreds of servings of any of these things that are on the dirty dozen list. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting uh, website to check out. All right. That is, that's all I wanted to say. And just to, to be clear that today we chose a very narrow scope. We chose pesticides and organic versus conventional, but um, maybe another time we can talk about some of the other layers to the organic, you know, people might have environment questions about environmental impact, um, ecosystem impacts. The, these are all considerations that all need a science-based lens. So thank you for your time. Yeah. Great thank you for having you. me.